the reason I want to talk about this topic is not because uh, you guys don't know how to treat asthma, but there's going to be something coming down the road, and I'm going to show you it that's going to be really important. As we move to Hugo, one of the sets that's being developed is a national uh, plan or provincial plan from the Lung and, uh, Association, sponsored in part by two people from Ottawa, Mana Javar and uh, from Montreal, Francine Ducharme, to use a, a, an asthma pathway. And we know that pathways, by and large, improve care. It gets rid of that variance between care and allows for individuals to do a little better. So twin A, as you guys all remember, is now five years old, shows up in the emergency department with cough, congestion, acute shortness of breath over the course of the evening, arrives at three in the morning, is C task two. When you look at his vital signs, you can once to see he's mildly febrile, a little bit tachycardic, a little bit tachyptic, and has some hypoxia. He has a PRAM score, and we'll talk about the PRAM is because most of us don't know what that is. A PRAM score of seven. He has accessory muscle use, and when you really look at him, he has decreased air entry bilaterally. So your differential diagnosis, any of the residents really quick, two or three things? Asthma, pneumonia. Right, asthma, pneumonia, anything else? Viral urticaria. Yeah, viral upper respiratory tract infection, all those particular things. We know that, uh, that you know, he had, when he did his prenatal history, because you've got that, he had some problems in the, as a neonate, right? Okay, moving along. So what are we going to do now? We're going to use oxygen, beta-2 agonists, epitromium bromide, steroids, mag sulf uh, in this particular patient. And that's where the, where the dilemma lies, because we all know the beta-2 agonists work. We know that oxygen is one of those things we give to everybody. Epitromium bromide is very common in the adult emergency department for most people who wheeze, and you give it, I th my understanding is almost to everybody. Uh, who do you give it to in kids, and what about steroids? So we're just going to talk really quickly about this. So I can see, you can all see this pathway way here at the back. This is the new Ontario uh, Lung Association pathway that's been sponsored by Francine Ducharme, who's done an extensive amount of uh, work and research in the, in the area of, of reactive airway disease, asthma, and pediatrics. And it, it really will be nice. It will go to every emergency department initially. We actually have adapted one that's very similar to this, if not exactly the same, that will be part of our Hugo network. So all of those hospitals that will be incorporated with those Hugo should be following this asthma care pathway, which will make it nice because in theory, if they say the kid's got a pram of five, and we'll talk about the pram in a second, then you will know how sick they are in theory, if they've applied the pram appropriately, okay? If in fact, they, they have done the right things and the kids should have received the treatment in that first hour, which is this part above the line up here, consistently across the board, all right? So what does that really look like, that first hour? Well, this is a, in the large view. Uh, know, can we turn that front light off so maybe you can see it a little better? But what's really important here are a number of factors, okay? The first factors are that you, you judge the child's severity of illness based on their PRAM. And we'll talk about the PRAM in one second. So depending, if you've got a low PRAM, less than four, you're, you're, you're three or less, you're considered mild. Moderate is four to seven, and greater than seven, so eight and above, you're considered severe, and you can you know, all sort of recognize impending respiratory failure. And what's important about using the PRAM is it really does allow us to sort of institute an incremental stepwise progression of treatment, right? This will be really important, I think, more so that for, less so for Peds Emerge Doc, more so for guys working out in the community in some of our sister hospitals who really don't feel as comfortable treating these kids. Here's the PRAM. The PRAM was uh, developed by the people at uh, Montreal St. Justine Children's Hospital, led by Francine Ducharme, published in 2008 and subsequently validated. And really what it does is it looks at the things we normally look at anyways in a child who comes in with respiratory stress. It looks at, uh, it looks at uh, you know, the suprasternal tug. It looks at the scaling muscles, which are these, which we sort of essentiate with whether or not there's descent associated with it. Uh, it also looks at how much wheeze they have and where the wheeze is located. And... Uh, where their breath sounds are, and whether or not they require oxygen, okay? Or where their oxygen sat is in room air. You add that score up, and you get a PRAM, okay? So if you get somebody who's got, uh, you know, some evidence of uh, suprasternal retractions and using their scalenes, you get two, four. If they have both expiratory and inspiratory wheeze, or if they only have expiratory wheeze, they get five. Uh, they have decreased to the bases, they, they would get six and then they would have a sat between, say it was greater than that, then they would have a PRAM of six. Does that make sense? So it'll allow everybody, and the advantage to this is that this can be done at triage. The triage nurse can do it. So you as a physician automatically have a, a well-validated process of being able to determine how sick this child is. In the first 60 minutes, this is the therapy that goes. So for the mild kid, you can see that the vast majority of this is really related to the use of just the beta-2 agonists, okay? So they get repeated beta-2 agonists, and depending on their response, you can do more. For the, so as highlighted here. 
In the second child, in the kid who has moderate disease, they get a beta-2 agonist, but more importantly, they get the same or more frequent beta-2 agonist, but more importantly, they're given oral cortical steroids. And I'll talk about the importance of when that is delivered in a second. And then finally, for the, for the moderately ill kid, oh, I forgot that little highlight there. For the moderately ill kid, we have the introduction, or for the kid who has a PRAM who's considered severe, the introduction of vipatromium bromide to the inhalational therapy plus the steroids, okay? So it gives you a stepwise progression based on the best evidence we have at this particular time. So this is from a meta-analysis done by Francine Ducharme and uh, Ms. Pautlick. And what it really says here is, uh, this is from the Cochrane database, is this is when you really need to be using ipatromium bromide, at least in pediatric population. And I think what's really important to realize here is that if you use it in the kid, it, it really has no role in the moderate or, less, moderate or less severity of illness, but does reduce the risk of A, hospitalization, and B, to intensive care units if it's used in the kid who is severely ill. So those with a PRAM 8 or greater. So, you know, I know there's lots of residents who come to us in the impedes emergent, you know, any kid who's wheezing, they want to add a petroleum, that's really when it's going to be a benefit. Does it do harm? No, it doesn't do harm. But if you want to use it for maximum effect, evidence-based, that's when to use it. When do we give the steroids? There were two publications that came out in this last year, uh, one from uh, St. Justine's group and one from the Ottawa group, looking at using steroids as within. The bottom one looked at steroids within uh, a presentation. So they had a 60 win minute window and everybody outside 60 minutes. And what they found is they gave steroids within the 60 minute window, you could reduce admissions between 10 and 15%. Okay? In the study done at the Bud by Roger Zemeck, they did this at all. So they came in, they were assessed their pram. If they had a pram greater than four, they were given steroids at the triage desk. And what they actually showed is a reduction of almost 20% of their admissions. So clearly, the earlier you get the steroids in, the better the kid does, the less likelihood of admission. All right. This is also from that table. So again, you know, many times we get the call from the periphery. I'm Dr. X, I've just seen this kid, he's wheezing, he's, you know, looks terrible, his sats are this, I've done a chest x-ray, and uh, I've given him Ventolin. You know, he's a five-year-old. How much Ventolin have you given him? Well, I've given him two puffs. And, you know, we laugh at that, but there's a reason for that, because when Moses came down from the mountains, he had this little tablet by God, thou shalt use two puffs in all cases, right? So we know that, so we can understand that he's a very biblical man. But if you really look at it, what's nice about this part of the table, it'll, it'll solidify how many puffs you can get. And you can see that a kid who's 10 to 12, uh, greater than 10 years of age, based on weight really, is going to receive up to 10 puffs. Now, how many people here have ever used 10 puffs? Besides you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always one in the audience, right? Okay, so, so in reality, and, and unlike in our adult population where we may have ischemic heart disease or other things to worry about, usually kids don't. So you can use that safely. It doesn't drop their K, and you can use it according to the protocol, all right? It also gives you some indication for other medications and therapies associated with that as we move along, um, including the use of such things as uh, uh, magnesium sulfate and steroids. Their recommendation for steroids is 2 milligrams per kilo of prednisone, or prednisolone, which is in this particular thing. There are a lot of debates right now going on in the literature with dexamethasone, which we use a lot of in, in the peds emerge because it's more palatable and they actually don't throw it up as Ms. Hames will remember from her study. But the reality is, is, that, is that either of those steroids work. But the important thing is not that they only work, but the, better, the sooner you give them, the better off the kid's going to do. Gary, could I say a comment about the 10 puffs? Yeah. I mean, I, I came in actually doing 10 puffs uh, for lots of my patients. And as a general rule, the RTs here will spike that order. They'll very seldom deliver it. So it's one of the things, if people are writing that order, they really got to make sure that the RT is on site or whoever's delivering it is on site. Absolutely. And, and we're going through the process right now through with uh, Rob Blanchard of educating all the RTs with this because we are a, a beta site for this protocol to be introduced in the PEDS Emerge. Uh, so we're going to be sort of trying to follow this pathway. Uh, and when the electronic order entry set comes, it'll be very similar to what we see here. It's already been worked on on paper, so that it'll make things a lot easier. So obviously, the resistance of your RTs uh, or other healthcare providers, if nurses are giving it, really requires the education to make sure that they understand why we're doing this particular amount of uh, therapy. Okay, 
The other thing that's really important about this pathway is that you get a reassessment within, multiple reassessments, but guaranteed a reassessment within an hour. And depending on how they look in an hour, determines further therapy. So they're really looking good, as in column one with the mild, get, you can consider discharging home. If they're not looking so good, and their pram continues to be hard, then there's a bunch of things that you need to go through in order to suggest that, you know, well, maybe we need to hang on to this kid a little longer, let the steroids have their effect, continue to bombard them with some beta-2 agonists. And if they're actually doing unwell, then you can go on to consider things like IV Ventolin or uh, magnesium sulfate. You'll note that on the chart, there's no IV Ventolin that's indicated. And there's a lot of debate in the literature. There's a couple of really good studies, early studies that suggest that, you know, giving 20 milligrams over 20, mil uh, um, 20 micrograms per kilo over uh, 20 minutes has reduced their admissions. That was done in, in New Zealand and Perth, Australia. Um, those studies have not been replicated other than in Australia. So the issue about IV ventil is controversial, but magnesium sulfate does make a difference as it does in the adult population. And again, there are guidelines when to use that. Clearly, if you're, if you're in a peripheral hospital and you're in a pathway with a pram greater than, than seven or a pram of eight and above, you're gonna be looking at trying to transfer this kid earlier after following that first hour of treatment, right? Okay. Finally, systemic corticosteroids, if you are going to discharge these kids, it's important they go home on uh, systemic corticosteroids. Again, a review from the Cochrane database from last year, and I highlight this area here that really says that they suggest that all kids go home on corticosteroids uh, who have failed to respond to a, a beta-2 agonist, and that's grade 2B evident. Furthermore, they tell you how much to give them to a maximum of 50 milligrams, okay? All right, so conclusions. One, oxygen is good, yes. Two, beta agonists, definitely yes. Three, epitromium bromide, only have a pram greater than sever or the moderately severe, severe to critically ill kid. Steroids, yes, early is best. And finally, uh, magnesium, yes, to moderately severe ill. And I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>